You've heard of parallel universes, right? You know, alternate realities that might exist alongside our own. Places that could have completely foreign physics and different fundamental rules that result in strange landscapes and extremely alien creatures. You ever wonder what it would be like to explore a place like that and maybe uncover the mysteries within it? Well, in the world of Pokemon, parallel universes are more than just a theory. We saw it in the Sun and Moon games with the Ultra Beasts, which gave us a little taste of the wacky creatures that could come from another universe. But there's another game out there. One that takes this whole alternate reality concept to the next level. Not only that, but it's one of the best Pokemon games I've ever played, and it wasn't even made by Game Freak. Allow me to take you through the events and gameplay of the most incredible fan-made Pokemon game of all time, Pokemon Xenoverse. Our story begins in the completely new region of Eldu, on a very special day, our hero's literal birthday. As is canon in Pokemon, on this day, our father Versal gets to decide what gender his baby will be, then he and our mom settle on the most exceptional name, Daddy Q. Flash forward five years and our father finally decides that it's about time that he takes us on a tour of the family ranch. As we're walking the grounds, we say hi to our family's mill tanks, pay respect to our ancestors, then suddenly, what was that? What? There are three Pokeballs here. Did someone lose them? Very suspicious, but our father scopes out the situation, then decides it's okay if we take a look. These three Pokeballs contain, shocker, three Pokemon, and our dad says that we should choose one to keep for ourselves. The three choices are the Water Dragon type Pokemon Shulong, the Grass Fairy type Pokemon Shyleon, and finally, the Fire Sound type Pokemon Trishout. Oh yeah, really quick before we choose one, the Sound type is a completely new type added in this game, with new Pokemon that have it, as well as some older Pokemon being updated to be Sound types as well. The concept of the Sound type is also really interesting. It's super effective against fairy, water, and flying types, weak to dragon and electric, and resisted by psychic. Obviously it's not perfect, but I think it does a pretty great job of balancing out some of the types and feels just as good as if it was introduced in an official Pokemon game. Oh, also like the video and subscribe to the channel. Okay, thanks, bye. Seeing as our playthrough was done completely blind with no experience in this game, we decided to go with the fire sound Pokemon Trishout as our companion to test out this new type. Right as we pick up the Pokeball, out of nowhere we hear, hey, you. Hands off those Pokeballs. Get him, Tyranitar. In a flash, we wake up safely back in our bed. It was just a nightmare. We head downstairs and tell our mom all about our horrible dream. Well, the time has come. Come sit with me. I think you're old enough for this story now. What you told me wasn't just a dream. 11 years ago, your father decided to bring you outside our ranch. That day, no one came back. Days after, Nana Flora knocked on the door in the middle of the night. What a relief to find you at the front door, but your father wasn't there. I haven't seen him since that day. Hearing this news sets us off, and the only thing we want to do now is go out and search for our father. But our mom just won't let us leave, and she sends us up to our room. To make matters worse, our only friend in the world, Trishow, says we should jump out the window? Wow, that is so not helpful. Not wanting any accidents to happen, we head over to close the window. pushed us. I got my eye on you. You. What was your name again? Oh yeah, Trish. That was your name. I'm watching you. Unfortunately, right now, this guy is our only quote, friend in the world. So we take him with us as we explore a family ranch, and after a while, we manage to find the exit and decide it's now or never to start untangling the mysteries of what happened to our father on that fateful day. Where do you think you're going? Did you really want to run away without saying a word? You can't even imagine how dangerous the world is out there. <sighs> I see talk is cheap with you, Daddy Q. Well then, prove me you're worthy of this with the Pokemon battle. And so we're forced to take on our own mother in a battle to the faint. This first battle gives me the perfect opportunity to comment on how amazing the Pokemon look in this game. Fully animated sprites in the style of Pokemon black and white, I really don't think Pokemon art gets any better than this style right here. Anyway, after getting put to sleep repeatedly, we're finally able to torch our mother's Jigglypuff, which proves to her that we are strong enough to make our own way through this world. Now we're finally able to begin our journey across the region to save our father. 
so we set off north to Route 1, where we roast some bugs and catch a Mareep, which we nicknamed Mary. Then we come across our first new Pokemon in the wild, the normal fighting type, Yemen, which we catch and nickname Yemi. Then we arrive at our first town, Hadwarf City, where we heal our Pokemon and, please, help, keep the children safe, call Aster, fast. Soon, out of nowhere, now, Suicune, extinguish these flames. With the town saved, we get a chance to talk to this blue-haired Aster character. Turns out, this town's hero actually used to work under our father before his disappearance. After recognizing us as Versal's daughter, he decides to bring us with him to investigate the cause of this fire, which he explains was a mysterious X pokemon that have recently been popping up all over the region. Not much is known about these Pokemon, all we do know is that they come from a foreign world called the Xenoverse. After explaining all this, he then tells us to meet him at Stardust Beach, just down Route 2. We make our way there there, catching a Heracross costume wearing mascot on the way, which we nicknamed Mr. Maggot. After defeating this hippie Axel and his sound electric type rocker Pokemon Bremond, we arrive at the beach where we find Aster, who has already cornered the troublesome Pokemon, Elekidax. So we rush in to help, but before we challenge it, Aster explains that the Pokemon who managed to cross over into our world from the Xenoverse are not your normal run-of-the-mill Pokemon. These Pokemon are extremely strong, having multiple health bars and boosted stats. Plus, they can only be caught with a special type of Pokeball and only after they've been sufficiently weakened. Armed with the raw power of information, we head into battle against the Elekidex. The Pokemon from the Xenoverse are completely different versions of the Pokemon found in our world, having different types, abilities, and stats. As we battle this Elekidex, we discover that it's actually a fire type. After weakening this thing enough with our babbling Trish out, we spot an opening in its defenses and decide to throw a Xenoball, which connects and secures this strange creature. Surprisingly, after catching it, we're actually able to add this thing to our team. So we nickname it Elisa, in honor of maybe my favorite gym leader of all time. And now with the threat neutralized, Aster takes us back to his lab in town, where he explains that if we want any real chance of finding our dad, we need to become a much stronger Pokemon trainer. And the best way to do that would be to travel the region and challenge the eight Pokemon gyms. He tells us there's even a gym in town, which would be a great place to start. So we take his advice and head over to our very first gym. Let me tell you, the gyms in this game are next level in atmosphere and overall design. Every gym has a unique puzzle or mechanic, which makes each one feel so fresh and original. The first gym is tucked away in a remote corner of the town, in a building that sits under a gigantic ancient tree. Inside, we find a spooky forest that's home to all sorts of grass and ghost type Pokemon. The puzzle in this gym is relatively straightforward, as the first gym probably should be. You just need to find the right way through these tree tunnels, which I later found out the signs in each room actually tell you where to go, but we made our way through with the old trial and error method. Our foolproof method did result in us running into the various keepers of the forest, these Trevenants, who didn't hesitate to kick us right out. Out of there. Eventually, we do manage to find our way through this maze and arrive at the gym leader Basil, who claims to be a peaceful man with only one major pet peeve, being interrupted while meditating. And guess what he was doing when we started talking to him? Yep, that's right. So he's majorly upset and decides to challenge us to a battle. Luckily for us, Basil specializes in grass types, so his lead Morlul stands no chance against Trish out, going down to a couple embers. Then he brings in his second and final Pokemon, the ghost grass type Spiritomb X, which I can't tell you how much I love this design. What an awesome concept for a new form of Spiritomb, being a sort of spirit of the forest. But anyway, this thing is still a grass type, so Trish is easily able to take it out. And just like that, we've secured our very first gym badge. As as we're exiting the gym, Aster meets us outside. He says that he needs our help and tells us to head back to the beach to meet with a sailor and sail to the remote Proxim Island, where one of his research assistants has gone a bit MIA. So we do just that, traveling to the island where we locate the research assistant who is a total douche, but gives us a little prototype Xenoball that he's been working on, which we take back to Aster. But it turns out this special prototype is literally just a regular old Xenoball with no changes at all. So of course, Aster is pissed and storms off to have some words with the fella. Now, without Aster's wise guidance, we somehow managed to find our way onto a cruise ship parked just outside of town, the SS Comet, with no idea where it's headed. On the ship, we run into Aster's good friend, Taraxo, who gives us a secret potion and instructs us to deliver it to the ship's captain to help him with his seasickness. So we head right up to the captain's room to deliver it, when all of a sudden, Captain, Captain, a school of Sharpedo has stormed our ship. I have no idea how much longer we can withstand their attack. 
The Sharpedoes succeed in their attack, wrecking the ship, but thankfully we survive the crash. We come to our senses and find ourselves stranded on the remote Dark Hole Island, with the only other person around being old crusty merchant Marlin. Desperate to survive and continue our quest, we head into the forest, start searching for a way off this rock, and maybe some other survivors from the ship. This spooky island is full of ghost Pokemon and little creepy teleporting girls. As we're exploring the area, we come across a wild Pupilon, which is a psychic dark type Pokemon and just too creepy not to catch. So we do just that and nickname it Pupper. Then eventually, after some more exploration, we finally find an exit from the haunted forest that leads us to a different beach, where we see a Lapras that's been horribly wounded. We decide to give it the secret potion because at this point, being seasick is probably the least of our dear captain's worries. After being healed, the Lapras beckons for us to get on its back, which we do because we don't really have too much to lose right now. The Lapras ends up surfing us over to the carcass of the very shipwreck that got us into this mess. Uh, thanks, I, I guess. With nothing better to do, we decide to investigate the ship to see if we can find any survivors. After scouring this spooky shipwreck and finding nothing, we run into the very same pack of Sharpedos that caused this mess, which are being led into a frenzy by one of those evil ex-Pokemon, Sharpedo X. Not wanting this to happen to any other ships, we decide to take matters into our own hands and battle this thing. It's a tough fight against this ghost water monstrosity, but eventually we're able to weaken it enough with Elisa and use a Xenoball to catch it. This thing is way too cool to not add to the team, so we nickname it Spark and send it to the box for later use. With their leader taken out, the other Sharpedo calm down and disperse. Then, as we're exiting the scene of the battle, we run into Taraxo again, who teleports us out of this horrible place to his home in the remote northern Polaris town, where we rescue this poor kid's stolen Hickaloo from a couple goons, and as a reward, he gives us a special gem that we can use to summon a hollow Pokemon to smash rocks for us. Also, as we were traversing the cave to rescue the dog, we found and caught a steel poison type Blingram, which we nicknamed Blangy. Anyway, with our new power to absolutely demolish rocks, we're able to traverse further down in the Zero Cave, then out onto Route 3 and 4. On the way to the next town, we come across this strange robot who is just screaming at a poor scientist. In a fit of rage, the robot creature runs away, but as it does, it drops an odd, seemingly useless earring, which we recover, then head into Neutron City, where we're presented with a town overrun with these same robots who are currently harassing this young boy. It turns out these robots are a part of the evil team Dimension, which has been causing all kinds of trouble across the region. So we team up with the boy to defeat the bots, then after the battle, our new friend introduces himself as Kay. We say our goodbyes to our new friend, and we start investigating why this town is absolutely crawling with these Team Dimension characters. After battling through more of these robot grunts, we arrive at the library, where we find these Daft Punk wannabes, Sergeant A and Sergeant B. Luckily, they get caught up bickering, which buys us enough time that the local gym leader Ginger shows up to give us backup as we take on these goons. We head into the battle and attack their two pawnee yards, but thanks to some extra dimensional power, none of our attacks are able to do any damage. Worse yet, they're able to one-shot all of our Pokemon and before long, our whole team has fainted. At this point, it's looking like all hope is lost. But suddenly, the room fills with a strange red energy, and that useless earring starts glowing bright red. Somehow, we know what we need to do. We find a mysterious terrestrial ring in our bag and give it to Trish out, which transforms it into its terrestrial form. Now, with the strength of the Earth on our side, we're able to dispatch A and B's Pawniard and save the town from the Team Dimension threat. With Team Dimension dealt with, the gym leader Ginger invites us over to his gym to take him on. As we're walking over, our new friend Kay catches up with us and challenges us to a battle. Thankfully, his two Pokemon team doesn't stand too much of a chance against us, and we're able to take out his Shockbird and his sound type, Aldui and Pikachu, easily. Then we go in to challenge the gym, which has us searching through a schoolhouse to get keys to unlock the various different rooms. Eventually, after reliving some of the highest points in our life, we find all the keys and unlock the final door, which leads us outside of the yard, where Ginger has brought out the whole school to watch us beat that ass. His lead Passimian can't damage our ghost type Sparky, so he swaps to his Halucha, which goes down easily to the shark. Then he sends in his absolutely jacked Eldui and Pukumuku, but even that bicep can't save it from our shark's wrath and it goes down as well. Then we finish off his Passimian and claim our second badge. We head out of the gym, then I think after having some time to accept his defeat, Ginger races out after us to give us another gift. The latest model of Pokeboard, fresh from his father's company in Vega City. Let me tell you, this hoverboard beats the piss out of any bike you've seen in a Pokemon game before. I mean, just take a listen to the theme song. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can feel the wind through my hair. Anyway, at this point, we float on out of town to continue our adventure. As we're exiting the town, we're presented with an evil monologue from some mysterious character perched on top of the library. 
that power will soon be mine. Huh. I wonder what he's talking about. Anyway, at this point we continue through Route 5 where we meet up with Aster again, who brings us to a small grove just outside of town with all kinds of unnatural plants and colors. He explains that this is an example of one of the strange reality shifting zones that seem to be leaking out of the Xenoverse, slowly covering the region. Yeah, that tree is looking like a serious problem. He says that if we don't put a stop to it soon, it'll spread across the entire world, destroying all life as we know it. After dumping this heavy, cataclysmic knowledge onto our little child's shoulders, he just kind of leaves, and we continue our adventure down the route, where we beat up on some jocks, bug catchers, and my new favorite trainer class, influencers, until we arrive at Stiletto Town. Not too much happens here other than this fun little fishing minigame that we get to play. Again, it's a simple but refreshing mechanic that's not too overused in the plot and so well executed. As we're heading on our way out of town, the mysterious figure from earlier approaches and introduces himself as Trey. He says that he was impressed by our battling skills and wants to experience them firsthand. So we duke it out and while his dark electric type Pokemon Sable does give our team a little trouble, we ultimately come out on top. After a battle, he calls us a noob, then completely disappears. You know what? I kinda like that guy. Now we actually head out of town and into the toxic, snowy, and generally inhospitable string forest, which seems to be under the influence of something very cold and very creepy. G get out. Oh, you don't, you don't have to tell me twice I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. Unfortunately, we don't leave quite quick enough, and we're ambushed by the ice electric spider that has imprisoned these poor souls here, Galvantula X. Thanks to its boosted stats, it's able to give our team a nice big helping of trouble, but after a few attempts, we exploit its four times weakness to fire to weaken it enough that we're able to catch it. We nickname our new friend Spooter, then after freeing the people from Spooter's webs, we head south, fight through Route 6, say hi to the mill tanks, and arrive at Milky Way City, where we're basically teleported back in time to the Dark Ages in Europe. Europe, where kings and queens rule the world surrounded by epic castles protected by their loyal knights and subjects. Comathon, this is Milky Way's city's kingdom. The atmosphere in this town is awesome, and after talking to the peasants and exploring some hedge mazes, we're able to march right up to the castle looming at the back of the town, which is also the town's gym, with the princess who rules this land being its gym leader. But of course, one does not simply walk right up and challenge the princess. First, you must complete three trials. After signing the mandatory personal injury waiver, we commence the challenge. The first trial, the trial of fire, puts us up against the horrible beast Drudagon. And this thing is level 30, making it a much higher level than our level 25 team. But thanks to some expert maneuvers from yours truly, we're able to fell the beast, then we're sent away with a golden cup as the castle crew prepares the second trial. So we use this time to heal, then head back to the castle to commence the trial of water, where we're tasked with fishing up a golden spoon from the bottom of this water, which we expertly nail first try. Then finally, we head outside once more as they set up the final trial, the trial of grass, which replaces the whole arena with a gigantic hedge maze. After some wrong turns, we're able to navigate to the exit where we we face off against the trial master Armand and his reindeer captain fairy team. We swiftly demolish his team, then walk into the throne room to take on the princess slash gym leader herself. With all this epic buildup, this fight has a lot to live up to, and it really doesn't disappoint. It ends up being the hardest challenge we've faced in this game so far, even with our Trish out having access to sound type moves, which reminder are super effective against fairy types. Her Mimikyu and Smeargle X aren't really too much of an issue. The biggest menace of our team is this Slurpuff, that has a crazy move set and ends up wiping our team more than a few times. But eventually, after training the team up a bit, we're able to use the mighty screams of Trish to overcome this chonky demon and secure cure the sugar badge. The next stop on our journey has us navigating the gravity path and heading into the gravity cave, where Elekid evolves into an Electabuzz X, then we get into some trouble trying to steal from another merchant and beat up on all the trainers in our way until it's dangerous this way, Team Dimension doesn't want anyone to get hurt, Bzz. wait, weren't we carrying out illegal research? Bzz. Hmm. You don't say. After catching them red-handed, we team up with Kay to battle the Team Dimension grunts and put a stop to the illegal research and rescue their hostage scientist. As a reward for saving his life, he offers to let us take the fossils that Team Dimension was so interested in. The choice is between the hand fossil, lame, and the space fossil, which we obviously choose. Then we find our way out the other side of the cave and take a walk down Route 7, until we arrive at Ishtar City, where something very strange seems to be going down. I must bring food to the master. I must bring food to the master. 
I must bring food to the master. Virtually everyone is like this. This is not right. We need to free these people. So we set out in search of this master character to find out what makes them so great. As we're searching the area, we come across a guard named Joel, who seems to be acting relatively normal, so we team up with him, and he guides us over to the temple in the center of town where the master has amassed a gigantic horde of berries. At the very, very top of this ridiculous pile sits the master himself, a Gengar from the Xenoverse who has used its powers to learn our language and enslave the town. After defeating his possessed guards, the Gengar decides to take matters into its own hands and challenges us. We're able to weaken it to the point where we should be able to catch it like the other X Pokemon so far, but unfortunately this Gengar is too powerful to be caught. And this almost ends up costing us the fight, but we're able to clutch it out and defeat the Gengar, freeing the town from its horrible spell. After its defeat, Gengar is able to teleport away with the entire berry horde before we can stop it, but at least the town is safe for the time being. With the berry pile removed, the town leader Nufar is freed from her temple, and as a thank you for saving the city, she rewards us with the ability to summon a hollow Pokemon to move boulders for us. Then she sizes us up and tells us we aren't yet strong enough to navigate the Sunflare Canyon to the east of the city. So she tells us to travel back through the gravity tunnel, then head north to seek out her grandpa, who is one of the four mysterious cardinals who rule over the region and will help us tap into our hidden potential. Here I was just gonna go grind on some wild Pokemon until I was strong enough, this sounds way cooler. So we follow the queen's orders and head back through the gravity tunnel, then travel north to Route 12 and onto Fort Belt Town. Along the way, we search out and manage to catch a dust meat, which we nicknamed Dusty. This little worm might not look like much right now, but it's actually the very first evolution of the pseudo-legendary Pokemon from this game, so it's definitely worth investing in. Anyway, at this point we continue on, climbing our way up the side of the active volcano Mount Starburst Delicious. until we arrive at the soot-covered Fort Belt Town. We make our way over to the Cardinal's house, but to no one's surprise, he isn't home. The guard at the door informs us that he's actually up on the very top of Mount Starburst. I guess Nufar never said it was going to be easy to find him, but still, you couldn't give him a little heads up about our visit? Whatever. We scale back down the mountain, then climb into the entrance of the cave that connects to the top. This is an active volcano, so this cave is completely full of lava and fire-type Pokemon. The most important Pokemon found here are the Turtonator, who are kind enough to allow us to hippity-hop on their backs to traverse the treacherous lava pits. And as we're battling through this sweaty cave, we do manage to catch a Torkoal with Drought, and Chi Chi learns the move Paper Cut, which allows it to evolve into a Grudaka. And this guy is a fairy steel type, super fast monster of a Pokemon. Now, after mastering the art of turtle hopping, we arrive at the chamber where the Cardinal is busy sweating to the oldies. And this guy gives us so much knowledge about the lore and all the problems that are currently facing the region. I'll do my best to condense it down a little bit. Basically, in the beginning of the universe, there was just one Pokemon called Vacuum, which was an all powerful being that encompassed everything. That means that it even encompassed the two opposing forces of dark and light. Unfortunately, despite its power, it was still subject to the impossibly strong force of time. Eventually, the arrow of time weakened vacuum so much that the dark being within it rebelled and was able to separate itself, establishing its own form, the evil Pokemon Dragalisk. This process ultimately killed Vacuum, and its death resulted in the formation of stars, galaxies, life, basically everything. This also gave birth to the light Pokemon Luxflon. The being Dragalus despises life, so in the end, it established its own world called the Xenoverse, from which it banished all normal life. In short, Xenoverse bad, regular universe good. Recently, something seems to be happening that's allowing Dragalus to make progress accessing our world, which is usually well protected and separate. That's where we find ourselves today. After that lore dump, the Cardinal tells us that we have to go into the Xenoverse to find the strength we need to save the world. So he takes us to a chamber where he's able to send us deep into this strange dimension, where we encounter our shadow self called an Altar. An Altar is a being born of all the hate and resentment that we built up over our life, and it usually exists only in the Xenoverse. Without warning, it attacks us with some primal, evil form of our sweet Trishout. Thankfully, we're able to fend off her attacks and defeat the Altar. Then we snag the Xenoversal core and ring, which we use to transform Trishout into its even stronger Xenoversal form from its current terrestrial form. After transforming, the evil powers of the Xenoverse are too much for Trish to handle, and it ends up lashing out, attacking us, then running away. 
We tracked Trish to another chamber in the mountain, where we discovered that its rebellion was triggered by a spell from the nefarious Gengar X from Ishtar Town. Unable to shake off the effects of the spell, Trish out attacks, so we team up with the Cardinal's Dragon-type Evolution Scalion and beat it into submission. This beating, when combined with, quote, the power of friendship, the Cardinal's words, not mine, is enough to help our Trish out throw off the spell and regain its senses. Defeated, the Gengar retreats yet again, and the Cardinal gives us the HM for Fly, which we use to head back to Ishtar Town, where the next gym awaits. The challenge for this gym sends us deep into the belly of the town's temple. Here, we decode the unknown alphabet and search sarcophagi hidden under these friendly Alolan executors for the magic orbs needed to get rid of some shells blocking our access to the gym leader. Then, after finding all the orbs, we head right in to take on the Queen Nufar. She specializes in water types, which our good friend Trish just so happens to have a great matchup against, thanks to its sound type. So, we use our newest move, Primal Scream, to take out our lead Beery Geary. Then, she hits us with a surprise curveball with our dragon type Haunchen. Not too big of a deal, Chi Chi comes in to use its fair and balanced fairy type on this poor dragon. Next, we get to see this game's take on Kofagrigus, Kofagrigus X, which is a water rock type with a completely killer design. But design aside, it's no match for our team, and we're easily able to clean it and her last Pokemon Melodic up and secure the title badge. Now that we've defeated Nufar and proven our strength, we're allowed to travel east into the scorching Sunflare Canyon, where we catch this sweet bone armor wearing Chickaboo, which is a ground dark type, making it a pretty solid addition to the team. So we nickname it Charlie, then bring it along for the ride to get some experience as we continue on our way. As we're traversing the desolate canyon, we come across a little ponyta. Aw, buddy, you lost? Oh, uh, sorry ma'am, I didn't mean to- uh uh, thankfully, we're able to fend off this defensive mother. Then, after the battle, Trey catches up with us and briefly explains how he's intricately tied to the Team Dimension robots that we've encountered on our journey. Not only that, but they're actually forcing him to carry out their plans against his will. Or so he says. Before we can get any more details out of him, he vanishes yet again, so we continue our journey through the canyon. We battle through some more trainers until Charlie evolves into a Peckabone. Then, we use a Dust Stone to evolve it immediately into a Rexaquim, which instantly becomes my new favorite Pokemon on the team. After the evolution, we overhear something disturbing in the distance. So Rapidash, have you changed your mind? If you even try to touch me, just know your little baby will pay for it. The Galactic Lieutenant Dahlia has kidnapped the Rapidash's baby, and as we approach to help, she uses her hostage to force the Pokemon to attack us. In a fit of rage, this Rapidash transforms into its storm form, which turns it from a calm beast made of peaceful clouds into a badass mess of angry thunderstorms. Thankfully, we're able to use our Torkoal's drought ability to get rid of the rain that the Rapidash sets up at the beginning of the battle. Then, we use the rest of our team to weaken it until Trishout is able to finish it off with a flamethrower. With the Rapidash defeated, we're able to send Team to mention running with their tail between their legs and rescue the baby Ponyta. Then we move south through the Steelix Gorge, where we have yet another encounter with Team Dimension and their two bickering robot sergeants. This time, we team up with Trey and his Sabolt to take him out. And as we're moving to exit the cave, the Rapidash and Ponyta from earlier catch up with us. Turns out that the Ponyta wants to join us in our quest, and we need all the help we can get. So we nickname it Paul, then move on south, out of the gorge and into the extremely creepy ghost town of Westar City. Now this is not your traditional ghost town, meaning all the people left. No, plenty of people live here. Rather, this is a town that is literally full of ghosts. Even Nurse Joy in the Pokemon Center seems a bit off. But we're able to muster up the courage to face our fears and explore the town. After a while spent wandering around, we come across an old abandoned saloon, where we meet this blue-haired character, Minta, the leader of the ghost hunting heroes, Team Geist. She tells us that Team Dimension robots have recently come into town and parked themselves in front of some of the most important facilities, completely blocking all access and trapping people inside. She's managed to trace the source of the commands causing the robots to do this to this abandoned saloon. But before she goes in to investigate, Minta decides decides to take us back to the Team Geist headquarters to introduce us to some of its members and get some backup. So we head back with her and meet all her kooky ghost hunting buddies, including Buster the Blastoise, Salem the overconfident but deeply self-conscious blonde heartthrob, Will the child who's easily spooked but has a big heart, and of course no team is complete without the eccentric inventor Chrysler. With introductions out of the way, we accompany the team back to the saloon, where this entire team of self-proclaimed ghost hunters ends up getting themselves possessed by you guessed it, a ghost. So we work our way through this genuinely super creepy saloon, saving each member of the team until we finally find the culprit behind all this nonsense, a Pokemon called Wisterak. 
which given its weakened state from trying to keep us away, we're able to take it on and ultimately catch this fiend. With the mystery solved and the problem Pokemon dealt with, we head back to the headquarters where Salem has engineered a way of controlling the Team Dimension robots. He then uses this power to remove the grunt standing in front of the local jail slash Pokemon gym, and we're free to enter to take on its gym leader, Salem. To my surprise, as we head in, it seems like this gym is just a single room with the gym leader sitting right on the other side, but as we approach him, something strange happens. We're teleported downstairs to the cells that house the inmates. After exhausting all our angles of approach at the gym leader and getting nowhere, we decide to begin investigating this downstairs area. Each of these cells contains a puzzle that all together make up Salem's gym challenge, and it has to be my favorite in the game by far. I won't spoil too much because I had so much fun working through it, and I don't want to ruin that for those of you who end up playing this game, which should be all of you who haven't already. Anyway, the challenge is basically a series of escape room style puzzles that are all so unique and rewarding to solve. After completing the puzzles, we open the final door, which ends up just being an exit that lets all the inmates out. So we have to track them down and bring them back to custody. After doing that, Salem reveals that this whole thing was his plan all along. And since we managed to escape, then bring everyone back, he agrees to battle us. Salem specializes in ghost types. And since our ghost shark Sparky is such a beast, it's able to basically sweep his team. It was a quick battle, but the highlights include seeing this somewhat gentle giant Scarfasmo for the first time, and this sheriff hat wearing grass ghost type Cacturn X. As a reward for beating him, Salem gives us the despair badge and sends us on our way. So we head south, where we arrive just in time to catch Team Dimension in the act of hijacking a train. Luckily, we arrive on the scene with enough time to hop on the train to see if we can't throw a wrench in whatever their evil plan is with this locomotive. As we enter the train, Kay also hops on to give us some backup, and we begin fighting our way up to the front. We work our way through all the cars, solving puzzles, and interrupting... dates? Until we reach the front of the train, where we're joined by Kay and Aster as we head in to find out what's really going on here. As we enter the final car, we see our nemesis Gengar X, encased in some kind of orange crystal, as well as a strange figure sitting behind a piano. What's wrong, young one? Meowth got your tongue? V Victor! Curse you! Yes, this is the big reveal. This is the Team Dimension leader, Victor, who was our father's old research partner and the person responsible for his disappearance. Hearing the news and being face to face with the man who caused us so much pain and anguish causes us to release Trish Shout, and worse yet, our altar is able to take control of our body. The energy released in this process is enough to cause a massive explosion, which gives Victor enough time to escape up to the roof of the train. But not quite enough time to get away just yet, so we chase him up there, but Dahlia puts herself in our way. We defeat her in battle, but Victor is still able to use his Tyranitar, which he's mutated with energy from the Xenoverse, to escape and briefly send us into the limbo between the two worlds. Thankfully, we're able to use our terrestrial powers to escape this prison. Then we find ourselves off the train back with Kay and Aster, who tell us if we want to stop Victor, we have to continue our journey west to the metropolis of Hypeline City. So we travel down Route 8 until we arrive at the city, which is a place run by the international music sensation slash gym leader Wallace Daddy, usually referred to simply as Daddy. And this town is nowhere near big enough to have two daddies. So we decide to take that matter into our own hands and make it our mission to defeat this imposter by any means necessary. Unfortunately, his recording studio slash gym is closed as he's busy preparing for a concert in the city tomorrow. With no choice but to wait, we head over to the first floor of his studio where there's a public banquet being held in celebration of Daddy's upcoming show. Free food, music, drinks, what more can you ask for? The highlight of the banquet were apparently these mysterious sweets that were almost instantly devoured. I say apparently because they were all gone by the time we could get over them. Disappointed but full and satisfied, we head back to our guest house to rest up for the night. The following morning, we head over to Daddy's show where he debuts a new song. But right as he's getting going, the entire crowd comes down with a mysterious illness. Except yours truly, of course. So the show is called off and we get to work on covering what could have caused this horrible mess. After some detective work, we discover that those mysterious various sweets from the day before were likely the source of the illness. And a janitor from the event tells us he saw a strange purple Pokemon place the sweets on the table. Hmm, a strange purple Pokemon? Did it look anything like that one up there? Uh, yep, that's the one. At this point, we team up with Wallace Daddy and climb to the top of his studio to save the city from this hilariously oversized Slurpuff, which thanks to Requiem and its ground type moves, we're able to do in short order. Now with the gigantic sweet monster brought down to size and the city saved, we're free to take on the challenges that await in Daddy's gym. 
This gym is basically a series of puzzles like the previous one, only this time, you're able to scan a code on the floor in the lobby of the gym that links to an actual Instagram account that the developers of this game set up for Wallace Daddy. And this Instagram has various clues and information about how to solve each of the puzzles. This is some next level stuff. I keep getting more and more blown away with the quality of this game. Anyway, we dance our way up the tower, shoving through the crowds and evolving Dusty into an ego hiss in the process until we make it to the top, where Daddy awaits us in his fabled solid gold recording Room. Now we finally get a chance to prove who's the real daddy around here. Spoiler alert, it's us. His sound type Pokemon, including Scrub Room, Pyroar, Arbok, and company, are no match for the strength of our team at this point, and we're easily able to defeat him, which secures us the beat badge, as well as the ability to head west out of town to the Samuel Oak Airport, where we continue further north into the twisting jungle of Route 9. Here we meet this strange feral child who we defeat in battle. As a reward for beating him, he teaches us how to summon a Feraligator to traverse the swamp land ahead. So we do just that and ride the Feraligator deep into the jungle until we arrive at the remote Dorado village, which is the home of another one of the four cardinals of the region, so we head right up to his temple in search of some guidance. But just as we arrive at his house, that feral boy comes running out of the front being chased by guards because he stole the cardinal's precious H mineral. To make matters worse, he instantly pawns it off on us to try to take us down with him. So we're forced to flee the scene and chase this little rascal deep into the sacred cluster jungle. We tail the kid all the way into the heart of the temple deep in the jungle, where we find none other than Victor back up to another evil plot, where he's kidnapped the Cardinal and is in the process of using him to harness energy from the Xenoverse. Unfortunately, we arrive just too late to stop this process, but not too late to rescue the Cardinal. So we go into battle against the Rose Red X that has the Cardinal under some kind of spell. The sound poison type Pokemon puts up a good fight, but ultimately we're able to exploit its weaknesses and weaken it enough to be able to catch it with a Xeno Ball. But even with the Roserade defeated, we're still too late to stop Victor's plan of filling Trey with the horrible, destructive X energy from the Xenoverse. With the process completed, Victor and Trey flee to the Team Dimension hideout as we return the Cardinal back to the safety of the town. After bringing the Cardinal back, he tells us that while he doesn't know its exact location, he knows that the Team Dimension hideout must be nearby, probably in Vegas City. So he grants us permission to pass through the town's gate to travel west on Route 10, into the expansive metropolis of Vegas City. As we're exploring the city looking for clues, we stumble across this circus tent that seems to have something a little off about it, so we decide to head in and investigate. Much to our dismay, right as we set foot in the tent, we're immediately selected as an audience volunteer for the show, which means that we end up battling each of the performers. After defeating the members of the circus, we find out that this place is actually the town's gym, and since we were able to beat everyone else, we get a chance to battle the gym leader. Or at least someone who should be the gym leader. Instead of the normal ringleader, we find that the same Gengar X from before is taking control of the circus while the gym leader was away. So we're forced to battle him instead to try to reclaim the hijacked circus. Thankfully, we're able to defeat him and send this prankster packing, hopefully for the last time. In the aftermath of the battle, the gym leader returns and of course she's pissed, but before she can lay out any punishment, Gengar's able to escape. Given the state of the circus, she's forced to close down and prepare for the next show, which she invites us to, to have a real battle against her. So after a quick rest, we head right back into the tent to take on the ringleader slash fire type gym leader, Henna. Charlie's able to make a big dent in her team, taking out her Rapidash and scoring a huge bone meringue on her Goon Bear. Then we bring in Sparky, who beats down three of her Pokemon on his own, and finally Trish comes in to clean up her circus tent wannabe Toxapex X. As a reward for our victory, we receive the brand badge. As we're exiting the tent, we're approached by a mysterious old man, who tells us to meet him outside of the old abandoned gym across town. We meet him there, where he tells us the story of this crumbling building and the region's final gym leader. The man says that the gym leader has disappeared and likely fled the entire region following the destruction of his gym. But he just so happens to know where the gym leader is probably hiding, and he believes we're strong enough to seek out the reclusive man and finish what we've started. So he gives us a plane ticket to a distant region where the final gym leader is moved, and we double back to the airport to board a plane to this foreign destination. As we touch down, the captain informs us that we've arrived in Vermilion City in the Kanto region. With the world in peril, we waste no time traveling over to yet another crumbling gym located in the southwestern part of the city. Here, we find a gaunt old man, cloaked in shadows. As we approach, he steps into the light, and we realize the final gym leader in this game is the grizzled old form of Lieutenant Surge. Not bothering with any pleasantries, he challenges us to a battle, which culminates in a showdown between Trish and his cybernetic Raichu. After hanging on through a super effective Thunderbolt, Trish is barely able to sneak out a victory with a clutch flamethrower. And with that victory, we claim the eighth badge, the Honor Badge. But Surge's story isn't finished yet. After we beat him, he tells us the tragic tale of how he ended up here, and the crucial information of where to find the Team Dimension hideout. 
night out. So we follow his tip and head back to Vegas City to the local casino, where sure enough, we find a secret switch behind a poster very sneakily guarded by this robot standing right in front of it. This switch opens up a passage to the sewers under Vegas City, where we find an entrance to the hideout that we've been searching for. With no time to lose, we head in to face our destiny. Inside, we find that Team Dimension has assembled some kind of gigantic space shuttle, and out front stands the newly energized Trey, guarding the entrance. He won't let us pass without a fight, but even with his newfound power and Sabolt in its ultimate form, we're still able to come out on top. In the throes of defeat, Trey has a sudden realization that Team Dimension has been using him all along, and decides that he'll help us put a stop to them once and for all. So he equips Aster, Kay, and yours truly with special Team Dimension uniforms that we use to board the rocket just before it takes off. As we begin hurtling into space, we start to infiltrate the shuttle in search of Victor. We battle through the ship until we enter a room where the newly fused form of Sergeant A and B, Sergeant S, emerges from a strange chamber. The behemoth won't let us pass, so we're forced into a battle. Even as a unified entity, with a super badass double Bisharp fusion, these numbskulls stand no chance, and we're able to defeat them and continue further into the shuttle. From here, we team up with Trish out to infiltrate the air duct slash Pokemon den to deactivate the next part of the security system, giving us access to the room where the next Sergeant Dahlia is waiting for us. Just before we take her on, we're able to evolve Dusty into its final form, the pseudo-legendary Gorgon, which we use to absolutely roll Dahlia's team. By defeating her, we're able to completely deactivate the rest of the ship's security system. Now, we finally get a chance to confront the big bad Victor and settle things once and for all. So we head into his chamber where we find Aster at the mercy of the villain, meaning that it falls on us to take him on, and so we challenge him to a battle. We easily take out his Cricketune, then he brings in his twisted Tyranitar X. We're able to swap to Paul and get some good damage before falling to the might of the mutated Tyranitar. Then we bring in Trish, but he's also defeated by this monster. So we're forced to swap to Chi Chi, who saves the day taking out its remaining HP. Then we bring in Dusty for cleanup duty, who easily sweeps the rest of Victor's team. In defeat, Victor reveals to us that our father is actually being held on this very spacecraft and offers to bring us to him. Anxious and unsure, but with little other choice, we agree and follow Victor. Being a man of his word, he unlocks the room where our father is surely being held prisoner. We approach the door, then proceed up the stairs where, at long last, we find our missing dad, finally reunited. But something just doesn't feel right. And it's at this point where our dad reveals that this entire thing his disappearance, our upbringing, this whole adventure was all a part of his elaborate plan to groom us as the final piece of the puzzle that he needs to access the Xenoverse. But why? Why does he want to go there? He then explains that his real name isn't actually Versal. It's Silver, and he's the son of the legendary Giovanni. In search of powerful Pokemon, Giovanni was able to travel to the Xenoverse, but ultimately was killed by its Lord Dragalisk. So our dad made it his life's work to avenge his own father by destroying the Pokemon responsible and ridding the world of the threat of Dragalisk forever. And now that we've played directly into his plan, he forces us to bring out our altar and Trish out, which gives him the energy he needs to complete his portal to the Xenoverse. But there's still a chance that we can stop him. So we challenge him to a battle, and despite his extremely strong team with an Entei and Mega Weavile, we best him. But somehow he's still able to open the portal, summon his ally Mewtwo X, and go in to complete his final mission before anyone can stop him, leaving Mewtwo X in our way to guard the portal and slow us down. Needing to save our father and the world, we have no choice but to face off against the strongest Pokemon we've encountered yet, Mewtwo X. Thanks to the combined strength of our entire team, we're narrowly able to defeat this beast and follow our father through the portal into the Xenoverse. Here, we traverse the inhospitable landscape until we find our father staring down the embodiment of evil itself self, Dragalisk. He's completely outmatched, so we step in to try to save him and end up doing battle against the Great Serpent God. We attack it over and over, but we're completely unable to do any damage. Just when it seems all hope is lost, suddenly, in a flash of light, the legendary embodiment of life itself, Luxflon, arrives to save the day. The two gods battle until Dragalisk appears weakened, and we step in to finish the job against the beaten down, but still incredibly powerful Dragalisk. And we're just barely able to best the serpent. Enraged after having its primary form defeated, Dragalisk begins a metamorphosis into something truly unstoppable. If it's allowed to complete this evolution, it will destroy all of reality as we know it. Staring down the apocalyptic monster, Trish summons the energy to change into its most powerful form. Then we beat this thing down to the point where Luxflon is able to prevent the cataclysmic evolution and open a portal for us to safety. Sadly though, Trey is forced to stay behind to fend off the creature and buy us time to escape. Badly injured and in overall sorry shape, 
we have just enough time to teleport back to our world, arriving in the strange oasis of Welkin Falls, where we meet the Cardinal Peyote, who assures us that the world is saved. The Cardinal then nurses us back to health, and we return home with our father, where, with our family whole again, we go on with our life. A few months pass, and we end up just forgiving our dad, I guess? I don't know, that must have been some apology. One day, out of the blue, we receive a letter from the Cardinals, inviting us to the top of Mount Zodiac, to face off against them and the champion Aster in one final challenge. Having no reason to turn them down, we begin the long journey to the ancient mountain. We battle up Route 11 and through Victory Road until we arrive at the entrance to the fabled Mount Zodiac, where the Cardinals await. Then, after making all the necessary preparations, we head in to face them. Our first opponent is the Cardinal Chua, and his psychic types. We take out his sigilyph easily, then he brings in his disfigured Tapu Finiax, who, with its psychic dark typing, is no match for the likes of Chi Chi. With the Tapu defeated, the rest of his team falls easily, and we move on to the second cardinal, Neva, with her ice types. Trish's ultimate form is more than capable of taking out her Avalug and Berardic, then she brings in her Tapu Leleax, who also meets the same fate as its fallen comrades. From here, the rest of her team is also defeated by the might of Trish without any issue. Then, we head on to face our third opponent our newest friend, Cardinal Peyote, who has a team full of flying types that are of course weak to the sound type. And our Roserade X and Rapidash are more than able to take down the team, including his flying dark type, Tapu Coco X. Now we arrive at the final Cardinal, the grandpa of the gym leader Nufar, Cardinal Abraham who has a team of dragon types that all happen to be slower and weaker than our incredibly strong friend, Dusty. So we're able to easily sweep his team, including his dragon dark type, Tapu Bulu X. Having bested the four cardinals, we finally get the chance to take on our dear friend and champion of the region, Aster. We ascend to the top of Mount Zodiac, where we do battle against him under a stunning tapestry of stars in the night sky. His team has some crazy diverse Pokemon on it, and proves to be at least somewhat of a challenge for us at this point. Charlie's able to force his lead Meganium to swap out, then he brings in his Drampa, who sadly is able to finish Charlie off. From here we bring in a Gorgon, which prompts him to switch to his own Grudaco, which is immune to our Dragon Pulse. So we swap to Trish, who destroys it with a super effective sound type Starburst. Next he brings his Drampa back in, so we swap to Chi Chi, who takes it out, then he brings in his Exploded Boy Electaburst, which is no match for Dusty, who cleans it up, but goes down shortly after to his Milo Mute. Thankfully, Trish is here to save the day, taking this dog out easily. Same with his Meganium, which he brings back in. And finally, he sends in his Suicune, who Mega Evolves, which allows it to live through our Boom Burst and take out our partner. But it's weak enough at this point that Ralph can finish it off on the next turn. And after beating Aster and saving the world, we are officially the new champion of the region. I gotta say, Pokemon Xenoverse is an incredible game that I can't recommend enough. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, throw it a like and subscribe to the channel for more. Anyway, till next time.